I'm like, how good is Jesus? How good? Come on. He's the one that saved us. He's the one that's redeemed us. You know, our sins aren't just forgiven. He's actually transformed us. The whole goal of Jesus coming wasn't just to get you to heaven. The whole goal was to get heaven inside of you. That's his goal. That's what he's done. I just, I don't know. Can we just speak the name of Jesus? We need to lift the name of Jesus high. I just love in worship this morning. We just need to speak his name. You know what? He's given us the ability to use his name. That's, that's, that's something. When, when I married my wife, she got the ability to use my name, which ain't worth a pinch of anything. Let's be honest. But when we come to him, he says, I want you to do business in my name. That's exciting. So we just, I, just, I just want to encourage you. Just speak the name of Jesus. Let it come out of your mouth. Just Jesus. I'm not here to direct you this morning. I just want to encourage you. Just speak the name of Jesus. We just, just repeat after me so we don't feel embarrassed. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only name by which mankind can be saved. Jesus, we honour you this morning. We lift your name high in this place as we've been doing. The earth will shake and tremble before you, Jesus. The doors opened because of you, Jesus. We just honour you. We speak the name of Jesus. What a privilege to you the name of Jesus in its right context. Our world uses it in a very incorrect context, but he uses it in the right context. Amen. Amen. Who's, who's full of expectancy this morning? I am. I'm full of expectancy because God just does stuff. And, and sometimes it's not stuff that we can see. A lot of times it's just internal stuff. Even this morning, God did internal stuff inside of me. It's, it's when we come into his presence, it's an incredible thing. He says, what I want you to do, I want you to come to me because I want to make you look more like me every time you come to me. Every time you open my word, I want it to be truth to you. I want you to understand who I declare you to be. And I want you to go away from me looking more and more like me. And we sung a song that earth will shake and tremble before him. And you know what? That's before the church. Because the church is his body. Amen. That's you. That's me. Isn't that that's scary? It's scary. It's, it's, it's something that God goes, oh, but hang on, hang on. I just want to sit in the background. I just, want to be, I just want to be a quiet Christian. You can be a quiet Christian, but your life can shout with the life transforming power of Jesus Christ in every moment of every day, whether you pick up one of these things or talk to people or not, our life should be declared his victory in us and through us. Amen? Amen. I'll tell you what, I, I had a quick chat to, to Pastor Al through the week and um, it, was, it was good because he was sharing with what he was sharing last week and I was sharing what we were sharing with last week and it really dovetailed. It. There's a real sense of expectancy in 2022. That expectancy should have been there in 2021 and in 2020 and in 2019 and for me going back until I was a little boy. But that expectancy is hopefully in you and if it's not, I hope it begins to rise in you afresh today. I know we spoke to that last week and very much like um, Al's message last week, it's not, this is not just a sermon. This is, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. This is, this is not going to be polished like him. He's a great communicator. I'm a bit rough and I'm a bit raw. But it's okay, I just want to speak with the things that God's placed on my heart. I want to share with you what I really believe is going to happen in 2022. Oh, what's going to happen in 2022? You want to know? I just want to, if you want to open your Bibles and we'll go to Luke chapter 4. Let's just start there. I love this. This is what I really feel that is going to happen this year. Or this what is this year is all about. The same as what last year was actually all about. But there are a few distractions that we had last year, wasn't there? And they've carried over into this year, but hopefully we can deal with distractions. So if you want to turn to, to um, Luke chapter 4, and we'll kick this off in, in verse 16. 
So he, this is Jesus, came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. It's a bit like us turning up to church on a Sunday, isn't it? You know, the Sabbath is actually the Saturday, but we gather on the first day of the week as sometimes just what our custom is. But we don't need to gather just because it's our custom to gather together. We need to gather together because we expect that we should gather together and that when we do come together, we get to encourage one another and be encouraged by one another and provoke one another to love and good works and, and help those who are heavy burdened, help those who are struggling, speak life and encouragement into them and have life and encouragement spoken into us and function as a body. That's, that's why we gather together. And he took, um, and so he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And he quotes Isaiah 60. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus turned up and says, this is my mandate from the Father to come and do this. When Isaiah prophesied that so many years ago, it was about 700 odd years earlier, Jesus says, and today this is fulfilled in your hearing. I am the fulfillment of this. And then we see Jesus going about and doing incredible things. Who would have loved to have been walking with Jesus in those days? And I just want to ask you, how much expectancy would have you have had then? Sleeping on the ground somewhere, waking up, where is he? Oh, he's up on the mountain praying. Oh, I wonder what's going to happen today. Oh, I, wonder, I wonder how many people are going to get set free today. You know, we can go through and we can re read all the recorded miracles that Jesus did. And sometimes there's a recording of, and Jesus healed many. I don't know who many are, but many is more than one. I think it's lots and lots and lots. It actually talks about if everything that Jesus has taught and done had it been written, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to be able to contain it and the world wouldn't be able to contain it. So I think he did a lot. In three and a bit years, I think the expectancy of the people that were following him, his disciples were, what's he going to do today? What's he going to do? And they just turned up and they just did a simple thing. They just followed him. And then sometimes he sent them out. And they did, they came back and they're going, you won't believe it, Jesus. Even the demons have to flee when we tell them to go. And he goes, no surprise. Just as Daniel said, it's no surprise to me. But there's a sense of expectancy because people were with Jesus and following Jesus and Jesus was doing stuff. Now, we don't live at that time. For a part of my life, I wanted to... I'm thinking, God, why couldn't I have just lived back then? Why couldn't I have lived at that time? It would have been awesome just to, to follow Jesus and see what he's doing. And he goes, but yours is better. I'm thinking, whoa, hang on. How could it be better than Jesus, following Jesus around when he was on earth? But Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. He says, I'm actually going away and it's better that I go away. It's better for you because if I go away, I will send another just like me. I will send a helper and he will be with you. I won't leave you as orphans. He will be with you. And the incredible thing is, when Jesus ministered and Jesus operated that whole time when he was on earth, he operated as a man anointed by God. I used to read the Bible and go, man, Jesus, you could just do that because you're the son of God and you're God and you can do whatever you want. But actually he limited himself to becoming a human. And he only functioned under the anointing or under the anointing, that's why it says he came the Christ, the anointed one. You know, it's very, it's very hard to follow God, but it's very easy to follow a man anointed of God. So we can follow Jesus right up to the Father. He said, I came that you would be restored back to the Father. That's the reason why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come just to forgive your sins. As incredible and as amazing as that is, he came to restore you back into relationship and to restore everything that was lost through Adam. He was to restore it through Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I'm actually the model of what it is to be a disciple. 
So you can model your life on me. And that's why scripture says he's the firstborn among many brethren. Hello, brethren. Because when he called us to follow him, he did a couple of incredible things. The first thing was he actually took our old nature and went, it's done away with. I give you a new nature. Now, we know, history tells us, our experience tells us, that while we may feel that, we don't fully experience that. We don't become this perfect person of following Jesus straight away. But in his eyes, he says, I can present you to my Father, holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. So that's how the Father sees us. So that's what we talk about of justification. We are legally justified before him. And then comes this incredible work of sanctification, which is the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, which is actually taking and pushing that old life of ours away from us and allowing the new life to, to come up. And it's actually the new life that pushes out. We get focused on trying to strip away the old. And God goes, don't worry about stripping away the old. Focus on the new. Focus on what has come. And it will push off the old. It will actually push it away from you. You won't become that. We, all, we talk about a lot of times about, you know, we read the Bible and we understand the Bible and we can get it here, but we don't get it down here. And we go, the longest trip in the history of the world is from here to here. And we want it to fall from here to here. And I remember praying one night and God said, no, it doesn't need to fall from here to here. What it needs to do, it needs to bubble up from here. And it needs to wash out what's up here. Because we have to know that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the washing of the water of the word. So we go back to him and he speaks truth over us again. He speaks truth again and again and again. So our expectancy should be that we are actually walking hand in hand every day with the Holy Spirit. And we should be waking up every morning like this morning saying, what are you going to do today, Holy Spirit? Just as the same as the disciples woke up all those centuries ago and were going, I wonder what he's going to do today. I wonder what he's going to do. I wonder whose life he's going to touch today. I wonder whose life he's going to transform. I wonder who he's going to deliver today. I wonder which broken hearted person he's going to actually begin to make whole. I wonder which one who was stuck in a prison house is actually going to set them free. I wonder what he's going to do today. All these things. But see what he did yesterday. See what he did last week. Man, he's got a track record of doing things every single day. We should wake up understanding that he's placed the Holy Spirit inside of us, that we walk with him. Romans 8 tells us those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the Holy Spirit has been placed in us, not coming upon us, but placed in us that we can walk hand in hand with him and do the things that he says that we're to do. So this actually becomes a part of us. But we get to change it. It's the only time we get to change things in Scripture when, when I read it through my head. Because Jesus reads, reads this as the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But now on this side of the cross, when we talk about, he talks about in John 10.10, 10, he talks about um, um, rivers of living water flowing out of us. He says, but this he spoke of that would happen in the future because he had not been glorified yet. But we're on this side of the cross. We're on this side of the resurrection. We're on this side of Pentecost. We're on this side where the Holy Spirit does not just come upon us, but the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. So it's not the spirit of the Lord is upon me, but the spirit of the Lord is within me. He's actually made his abiding place inside of me. The incredible thing happened when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he cried out and he said, it is finished. It says the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom and the Holy Spirit who had been encapsulated in one place on the face of the earth to sit there and it was the only place that human could come and interact with the Spirit of God and come before him, which was one person once a year and under certain circumstances covering of the blood of animals and even with a rope tied about them because they could possibly die in the presence of God God rips the veil and the Holy Spirit says finally finally I'm not and that's I'm not saying God is everywhere so the Holy Spirit can move and do whatever he did he came upon many people and stuff like that but the reality is he says no longer will I be encapsulated into this area no longer will the holy of holies be here but the holy of holies will be inside of you 
This is the thing. He's actually taken his spirit, which is just like Jesus, and placed him inside of us. So we walk around carrying the Holy of Holies, being that, carrying the presence of God. So the spirit of the, God, of the Lord is within me. Is it within you? If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you just ask him. The word of God says you ask. He said, if you people, if you people being evil know how to give your kids good gifts, how much? More shall my Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. You don't need someone to come and lay hands on you. What you need to do is get before God and say, I want all that you have for me. You can't be greedy with God. You can't say, God, I want more of you than I'm entitled to. Because we're entitled to the whole lot. Not because of how good we are, not because of our track record, but because of the mercy and the grace of who he is. So our expectancy should be, Lord, I want to experience the fullness of who you are. And not only do I want to experience the fullness of who you are, but I want all those around me to experience the fullness of who you are. So I can read this scripture. You could read this scripture that says, the spirit of the Lord is within me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me, you and I, to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And I felt God say, every year, Tony, has been the acceptable year of the Lord. Every year in your life, I've actually declared that over your life. But there's been distractions that have taken your eyes off what I've called you to do and to be. I'll put that in the right order distractions to take your eyes off who I've called you to be and then from that to do. We've got distractions galore. We thought we put some to bed last year. We thought on the 15th of December we're never going to have to worry about certain things ever again. Well, some people hoped that. Other people knew that it was making a comeback and all this sort of stuff. But the thing is, it's a distraction to distract us. Fear is a distraction. Doubt is a distraction. And it's okay to doubt. It's, it's okay to doubt. If it wasn't, we'd all be in trouble. It's okay to doubt. But tell you what, it's not okay. It's not okay to stay in the doubt. What's okay to do is to go back to him and say, hey, you've proven yourself faithful from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. From when you existed to forever you are faithful because you do not change distractions have come to take our eyes off him and what he's called us to be distractions have come and fears come in and we've taken our eyes off Jesus and we've looked to other things and they've shaken us they've shaken many people and they've they've caused us to withdraw They've caused us to go, oh God, I need to save myself. I need to, I need to push myself aside and I, I need to come away here and cocoon myself and protect myself. And Holy Spirit's just going, what are you doing? You're not even your own anymore. You're mine. Sometimes we, we have to take the word of God as literally as it's meant. When Paul writes, he says, you are not your own. fun preaching this in the West because we've got rights and I have this and I have that and I can do what I want and I can pick and choose and the reality is God allows you to pick and choose but I would encourage you as you read the word of God you would allow the Holy Spirit to just go hang on this is real in my life so when we're pushing ourselves aside saying I have to protect myself he goes well what about me he said I think I'm your protector So I think we sung about it this morning. I'm going to sing in the middle of the sunny day when the birds are chirping and everything's going great and I've got no problems whatsoever. There's money in the bank. Everything's good. My kids are all fantastic. You know, my spouse is amazing and they're looking after me really well. No, I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. I'm going to sing when it's hard. 
I'm going to sing when it's difficult because I'm actually not looking at the storm. I'm looking beyond the storm. Because my expectation is not on the storm getting bigger and the storm getting stronger. My expectation is that I'm going to come through the storm because the one who's called me is bigger than the storm. There's an expectation inside of me that people are going to get healed this year. There's an expectation inside of me, and it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit's expectation inside of me. He's going, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. This is, this is what it's all about. And so I started this year thinking, man, it's just going to be a brilliant year. We're going to hit the ground running. We're going to turn up in our first service. We, we turned up on the, on the um, sunrise prayer uh, on the first, and there was a huge crowd that was there, and we were praying, and it was great to hear. We turned up on Sunday morning, and I asked the people in our congregation, what is, what is he saying to you? What is he saying to you? What's, what's Holy Spirit saying to you? And they're talking about, oh, there's going to be this tsunami coming through of God moving and doing stuff and these things are going to be happening and I'm sitting there going that's cool and people are going oh I think that this is a year we're actually going to push through into areas that we've never been into before but we probably should have been to I'm thinking that's cool and right across the congregation those in there, and it's all pointing one way it's all pointing to Jesus it's all pointing about why he came and what he's here and I've, and I've got friends and they're sitting there and they're going oh man you know I just can't wait for Jesus to come back I'm just over this I need Jesus to come back I want him to take us out of this and we just go to be with him and I'm thinking that's pretty awesome but it's also just a little tad selfish because you're with him now he's with you now What separates us from him? Absolutely nothing. His blood made us be able to enter into the Holy of Holies. And in fact, he transformed us into a way that God says, as I designed Adam to be, as I designed mankind to be, that my spirit would dwell inside of him and he would do my bidding on the earth. Not out of compulsion, but out of relationship, always having a choice. That's why he was able to sin. That's why we're still able to sin. But we don't have to, because it's no longer our nature. And he says, I've placed me in you. And I talk to my friends and I say, but you know what? You're with him. Separate you from him. There's nothing. There's nothing. But why did he come? Why did he come? He came to restore mankind back to the Father. And I look around at my community and there's so many There are so many that don't know him. I look around the church and there's so many that don't know him as he wants to be known. He wants to be known in a way that is not third person, distanced. I know about him. I know about him because Pastor Al talks about him. I know about him because Daniel talks about him. I know about him because my mum and my dad know about him and they talk about him and I have a relationship with God through them. And he says, no, 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 no. This is not the thing. I want you to have a relationship with me. We look at the Old Testament. I'm probably not going to be using too many. You can check them up. They're all there. In Exodus, he says, when the, when the children of Israel come out, and he, he wants them to come up the mountain and they're, they're petrified because they're looking at this cloud and lightning and flashing of fire and they're going, Moses, you go up there. You, you go, tag, you're it. You're the leader. God's anointed you. You go up there, you face God. And I add this in, in italics. And if you survive, come back and tell us what to do. Didn't work out well, did it? Yet God says, he said, I brought you out of Egypt to bring you to myself. That's his goal. Sometimes our expectations is I just want to be forgiven. I want to let you know you are. You are completely forgiven. You are completely set free. It's like the best etch-a-sketch you've ever seen in your life. You know when the etch-a-sketch, oh man, most you young people wouldn't know. Some people, my vintage would know what an etch sketch is. You could draw on it and then you go, whoosh, whoosh, and it was gone until it got a bit older. And then you go, whoosh, whoosh, it's still there. There's, there's, there's markings that are still there. There's still something. There's a, there's a residue. There's a, there's a, I can still see what used to be there. I still see what it was drawn. 
And the enemy comes back to us time and time again. You remember? You couldn't forget? (sighs) He comes to me, he goes, I know how bad you were. And I I was classed as a good kid. I was. I did what I was told. Oh, man. Inside of me was so rebellious. But I'd submit to my mum and dad and I'd go and do it. And, and people go, oh, man, isn't that good? He just does what you said. And inside me is a heart of rebellion, a heart going, man, I can't stand this. I hate doing this, blah, blah, blah. And then I found Jesus. And I, I had friends that were older than me. They were drug addicts. They were doing all sorts of stuff, living lives, and they're getting saved, and God's cleaning them up. And, and God saved me. And I'm sitting there, and some people are sort of going, what do you have to save you from? I said, mate, sin doesn't make you bad. Sin makes you dead. It's not how bad you were. It's that all of us are dead outside of him. But he came to make me alive. He came to place his life inside of me and that I would live a life now. The life that I live, I live to the glory of God the Father. That's what he's called us to do. That's why the earth will shake because he's got a church that will actually believe what he said he's done. He's got a church that will actually say, hang on, we're going to step into with expectancy because you are the one who changed my life. You changed my world and there's people around me that you need to change their world as well. And so I'm going to step in and believe. I'm going to step in and understand and say, you know what, just like the disciples who followed Jesus, I'm going to be led by you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to wake up of the morning and I'm going to declare that my life is not my own, but my life belongs to you. I'm going to declare that the reason why I'm still here on planet Earth is because you've got a plan to bring your glory through my life to bring glory to you so that the world will be touched through me because I am yours. And because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, He has anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord has been placed with inside of me. He's actually, you've given me your name to be able to go and do business in your name. I can actually go and write checks that you cash. That's the exciting thing. And we go, oh no, but my life is just like this. My life is... You, you don't understand. You don't understand what I've been through and, 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 and what's happened to me. And it's, it's just good that I'm here. And God says, yeah, it's good that you're here. It's good that you turn up on a Sunday. It's good that you open your word and you do that. But please let me speak to you and tell me who you are. We can be like the old etch sketch and still carry a, a shadow of our former self. And God says, I don't see the shadow of your former self. I see my son in you. I see you as holy and blameless. And these incredible words, above reproach. Wow, that's how God sees us. And from that position and from that place, we can understand that you've called me to touch a world that needs you. Many of you, may never ever stand up and preach a, preach a message. But your life is a living testimony. It's an epistle of what God has done. And I want to encourage you, go through and read the epistles. Read through the whole lot. Start at the first chapter because it always lays out the same pattern. Because Jesus has done this, we can now live like this. And it's all because of him. Everything's because of him. But there needs to be, and that, even that expectation, it's not about working it up yourself. It's not about whipping yourself up into a frenzy of going, I need to expect, I need to expect, I need to expect. No, it's about spending time with him. And as we spend time with him, expectation grows. Because we understand as we spend time with him, we're transformed by him. As we open the word and say, Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me, show me, illuminate to me what you want to speak to me. Or if we just spend that time in prayer or in worship where we actually just stop singing the lyrics of the songs and we begin to communicate with him with our spirit and just begin to say, hey, this is where I'm really at. You know, I can sing the song and I can put a mask on, but God, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm, I still feel I'm broken in some area. And Holy Spirit says, great, because this is my mandate. I want to make you whole. I want to put you back together again. 
And someone I was sitting with was talking the other day, there's a particular method of, um, of repairing, uh, it's, it's a Japanese word about repairing vases, and it's like when a vase is broken into, into hundreds of pieces, they will take it and they'll use gold to join the pieces back together again. So the vase will be able to be useful once again, but the vase actually becomes even more beautiful than what it used to be because it's actually joined together with gold and the gold is visible. And that's what he does with our lives. In every part of brokenness in our life, he says, I wanna come and make you whole again. Because the, the whole goal of him coming and saving you is to make you whole and complete in him once again so that we can live that incredible life that he's called us to do, so we can live a life that brings value and glory to everything that he said. 2022, you can say, we're nine days in, it's okay. Let's reboot and start in 2023. I've missed the start. This is the incredible th difference in God's, in God's economy versus our economy. We always do the, we'll start on the first of this month and if it doesn't happen, we'll wait until the first of next month. And if that doesn't happen, we'll start the first of that month. After that, let's just, just let's write the year off and let's wait until next year and let's start again. But with God, it's today. Today. And, and every day is today. Not every day is Sunday. Not every day is Monday. You only get one in seven of those. But every day is today in the day that it is today. So tomorrow will be today. Tuesday will be today on Tuesday. So today and this year, today is the acceptable year of the Lord. Today is the day that we can actually begin to go, actually I'm called for so much more than just sitting in the background. I turn up, I pay my money, I read my Bible, I do this and God says, yeah, that's cool. But I wanna live in you and through you and touch the world around about you. We are called for so much more than what we've ever believed because of the distractions around us have told us that we're not measuring up. But when we pause and understand that God says, you've already measured up, I've made you measure up. So how about we change the way that you think and I raise your eyes of your expectation of not going, our expectation, so what do I mean by that? So our expectation of driving down the street, it's a busy day, we're running up to Christmas and I need to get a park and I need to, and we're going, oh God, I just need a park, I just need a park, I just need a park. And we drive past the shop that we need to get to and there's no park. And it's like, oh God, what have I done that you haven't, that you haven't loved me enough to give me a park? And we, we, we sometimes, we, we laugh at that. Hey, but I've lived that. And, and I know many Christians do. But we don't have to live that anymore. We need to understand that the love of God is established. If you want to know how much God loved you, look at Jesus hanging on the cross. That's it. How much more could he love you? It's actually impossible for him to love you any more than what he does love you. And it's actually impossible for you to do enough things for him to love you less. It's impossible. The status quo is, the baseline is, he loves you with an everlasting love. At the end of the day, when it's all wrapped up and he, he separates sheep from the goats and some go to a lost eternity, he loves every single one of them as much as he loves everyone that he welcomes in. It's, it's not negotiable. The love of God is not negotiable. It's not, it's not determined on what happens to you and what doesn't happen to you. It's the fact that he says, I love you with an everlasting love and I've put my love upon you. And while you were still a sinner, I died for you to make you look just like me. This year is a year of expectancy. There's a, such an expectancy in Holy Spirit that says, come on, come on, push out, push out of what we would call the normal Christian life push out of that and actually step into the actual normal Christian life. The normal Christian life, Christianity 101, is us going around healing the sick, casting out demons, doing all these things. Shall I read it? You can, you can turn, it's in, it's in Mark. I'll read the one out of Mark. We call it the Great Commission. 
Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You may never preach in front of a group of people, but can I encourage you, sit on your back veranda and preach to the birds. If you live in the countryside, get out there and preach to the crawlies because every creature needs to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now he's getting weird. Text, text Pastor Al and say, Pastor Al, he's getting really weird here. But no, if you read in, in Romans chapter 8, it says all of the creation is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It was, it was subject to futility until, and it needs to be released into the revealing of the sons of God. So who are these sons of God? Ladies, it's you as well. Because what it is, it's talking about those who have the same character and nature of him. There's a couple of words for sons in the, in the, in the Greek New Testament. There's, there's technon, which is you're a son because you've just been born into a family. You're a son by the fact of you just mere birth. But then there's this word that says weos, you're a son because we see the character of the father in you. Jesus said to, to our great friend Philip, he said, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Because Father goes, Philip goes, just, just show us the father. Just show us the Father. And he says, how long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The same cry, Holy Spirit, that for every one of those who are following Jesus, that it would be, if you've seen, if you've seen Daniel, you've seen Jesus. Absolute blasphemy. No, it's not. Because he's the firstborn among many brethren. And we should see the Christ in you. Christ in you. Christ in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is, this, is, this is the basic, this is Christianity 101, that we should look like him. Christianity 101 has been sold to us. Come in, say a prayer, get saved. You can go to heaven when you die. The reality of Christianity is you come in, you lay your life down. Let my life come inside of you and let me live my life through you. Let me live my life with you. And we get to follow him as an apprentice. I was listening to a message last night and this is one of those things when Jesus said to, to uh, Andrew and Simon, he says, come, follow me. Come, follow me. And I love it when we see the, um, um, Peter do all the things that he says, man, I'm going to die for you. There's no way. No one's going to touch you. I'll kill them. And we go, oh, Peter, you're just, a, you're just this and that. He's a guy that pulled one sword in front of a whole crowd and had a swing and he took off the high priest servant's ear and Jesus turns and says, put it away. And then Jesus comes and takes that ear and puts it back on. Peter was going, I will do anything and Peter's doing, oh, in my strength I'll do it. And then Jesus restores Peter alongside a lake and he says, follow me. And he turns he says, but what about him? For the first time in Peter's life, it wasn't all about Peter, but it was about John. He goes, but what about him? He goes, don't worry about him. You just follow me. And this guy was saying, he says, some, one of the translation that brings it down, it says, that follow me can get translated in, become my apprentice. And I think that's awesome. He trusts you to do the things that he did. He trusts you. The reason why I'm, I'm here speaking this morning is because your pastor trusts me to speak to you. And that's incredible. I actually said to him, because I know he's watching. He said, don't worry, I'll be watching you. And I said, it's one thing to have God watching me. It's another thing to have you watching me. But he trusts me to speak to you, to encourage you, to provoke you to love and good works. But God Almighty trusts you to do the things that he did. What's the scripture? Greater things than these you will do. My mind can't cope with that. But I'm pretty sure that you might have heard a message last week that says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. This is God that we serve. What's the expectancy in my heart this year? Not just that things get done. 
the expectancy in my heart this year is that the church will step into the fullness of who he's called us to be. That we would be transformed into who he says that we are. That we would grab a hold of him, grab a hold of his word and say, I may not be feeling this right now, but it's not based on feeling. The truth of your word says it, and I want to believe it and I want to step into it. It's not arrogance. He's actually invited us into something that is so much bigger than we've ever known. We've got this gift that came on the first Christmas tree ever, which was a cross, that we could come and be restored back to the Father and that we could live a life in perfect harmony with Him once again, as if sin had never existed, because in our life it doesn't. That's incredible. This is a year of expectancy. I hope there's an expectancy in you. I hope that this does something just to even whet your appetite as to God, what could it possibly be for me? And it's not about coming back and cheering about the things that we do. They're gonna be great. But it's about cheering about the fact of, look who he made me to be. Look what he's entrusted with me. He's given me the greatest, the greatest ministry of all. And for all of you who think that you don't have a ministry, he's given you the greatest ministry of all, which is the ministry of reconciliation, which is the ministry of being able to go to someone and see them reconcile back to the Father through Jesus Christ. It's incredible. But I'm not called to that. I know you're called to him. And whatever he wants you to do, Understand this, that you are in a position to do it because he's chosen you. He says, you didn't choose me. He's talking to yourself, you didn't choose me, I chose you. That you would go about and you'd do these things and your fruit would remain. So I'm just going to finish with that this morning. But as a little thing, I don't know if there's anyone here, I know we've got a few people at home that aren't well and we're going to pray for them. But if there's anyone here that has any needs that we can pray for, if you would be bold enough to raise your hands, we're not going to ask you to move from where you are. Anyone. Everyone's well. This is what we want to do because normally what would happen, we would have someone say, come out the front, we'll have someone pray for you. But I think we should just gather around because God wants to use you to speak life and healing over people's lives. God wants to train us to be able to do that. God wants to actually, one part of the expectancy inside of us is that when we know someone's sick, that we actually begin to pray for them. I know God's challenged this many, many times in, in my life as people come up and they go, oh man, I'm really sick. And I'm just thinking, oh man, we'll pray for you. But not right now. And God's going, yeah, right now. How about you just lay hands on them right now and actually begin to believe that I might actually heal them. And the reason why we say, well, we'll we'll, we'll pray for you when I'm praying is because we don't want the fact that they're sitting in front of us coughing and spluttering and we pray for them and they're still coughing and spluttering because we think, oh no, God, it didn't work. So I won't, I'll step back. Oh God, it didn't work, I'll step back. But God says, speak to the mountains. We need to learn how to speak to mountains. Cancer's No harder for for us to see cured than the common cold. Because we don't do it. He does. But do we have expectancy that he will? Do we have expectancy that he will heal the brokenhearted? Because if we don't, we don't put our hand up and say, here I am, Lord. Use me. Here I am, Lord. The same call that Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, is on us as well. The same thing he said, this is my mandate. Still his mandate, we're his church and he wants it to happen. So I want to invite people to come around and to pray. And I'll pray for those who are at home. And I think we can just finish this. Oh, Daniel, if you just want to come up and you just want to play, mate. And I know there's other people here that have parts in their lives that are still broken. And you don't have to put your hand up. You don't need anyone to come around you. But I just want to encourage you, just as Daniel plays, just just get before God and just say, Lord, I've hung on to this for so long. 
but now I know that I don't have to hang on to this anymore. I actually can be made whole. I actually can be made whole and complete. Holy Spirit's not always polite because Jesus ministered under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And when he went to the pool of Bethesda, there's a guy that was there and had been laying for 38 years. And he asks him this question. He says, do you want to be healed? And he comes out with these explanation as to why he couldn't be, why I can't get to the pool when the angel stirs it, why I can't get there because others jump in. But Jesus isn't asking us, you know, what's the excuses? He says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be complete? And the enemy does all that he says to say, you're not worthy. No, it's not impo- it's, it's impossible. You believed it before and you got hurt again and it was worse than it was before. But I want to encourage you that the Holy Spirit just wants you to know that you can touch Him and that He wants to touch you and do what only He can do. No human can do this for you. It is God alone. But I can tell you one thing, that God wants to use the human force that He calls the church. To one, understand who He is. Two, understand who we are in Him. And three, understand what He wants to do through the church to touch the world, to see chains break, darkness tremble, the enemy flee. But we've got to believe it. The Word of God says, those who come to Him must believe that He is. I just pause on that, must believe that He is. And that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. We don't serve a wishy-washy God. We serve the God of all creation. We serve the God who spoke this whole earth into being. We serve the God who fashioned man, the only difference in creation, fashioned man out of the dust of the earth and then breathed life into Him. The amazing thing is when we come and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's that Ruach, it's the breath of God. He comes once again and recreates us. We were made in His image. He recreates us in His image and He breathes inside of us once again. And in Romans, it talks about it and says, and this same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in your mortal body and brings life to you. The life that we live is not just the existence that we have. The life that we live is His life inside of us. The Word talks about us being jars of clay and this incredible treasure being placed inside of it. We ain't nothing more than jars of clay, except we're a vessel of honour because of what He's placed inside of us. He's placed Himself inside of us. So let's pray for those who are unwell. (laughs) Heavenly Father, for those here, for those at home, we just lift them up before You right now. And actually, Lord, we just be really obedient. And even though I can't do it, to those who are at home, Lord, You said, lay Your hands upon the sick and they will recover. Lord, we believe that You will make them whole and complete and well. Father, we thank You that sickness must bow its knee before You. We thank You that Jesus is the name above every other name. Every other sickness has a name and it bows its knee to Jesus. Father, we thank You for those who are feeling broken and downcast this morning, Holy Spirit. You can wrap Your arms around them, Lord God. You can begin to speak to them from Your Word. You can begin to speak to them, that You could breathe, as it were, the breath of God back into them that they would begin to see themselves the way that You see them, that, you can see, that they would see themselves as holy and blameless and, and above reproach in Your sight, that we could see with Your eyes, Lord God, that we would understand that we've been called to this Kingdom of Yours for such a time as this. We just thank You, Father, because You have transformed our lives and You have renewed our lives. And we just thank You that You brought wholeness and completeness to every part of us. And the parts of us, Lord God, that we haven't experienced that yet you are still being faithful to complete that good work that you have begun in us, Lord God. 
Holy Spirit, I ask that You would just breathe afresh on Your people, that expectancy would increase this year. Expectancy of encountering You. Expectancy of being transformed when we're in Your presence. Expectancy of carrying Your presence to a lost and dying world. Expectancy that You would speak to us, that You would give us words of knowledge. We would expect that we would actually put our hand in Your hand as we awake of a morning and say, Lord, what do You want to do? Here I am, I'm Yours. I'm going to my workplace, but what do You want to do there? Lord, where it's not about what happens on a Sunday, but it's what happens seven days a week. Lord, we ask that You would build and increase expectancy within us. Lord, that we would be obedient to You and to no one else. That our eyes would be simply focused on You and not on the distractions around us. Lord, that we can be what You've called us to be. And from that position, that we would do what You've called us to do. We just thank You, Lord, for the freedom that we have in You, for the life that we have in You, for the promises that we have in You. And Lord, we believe that they are yes and that they are amen. And Lord, for where we don't believe that they're yes and amen, we stand on the truth and we say, no, they are yes and amen. And Father, where our soul rises up and says, no, you don't understand it's like this, that our spirit would rise up and say, hang on, you have a new master and there is a new truth. We can trust the Holy Spirit because He will only speak that which He is. And Jesus, that we can walk as your disciples the same way that you did when you said, I only do what I see the Father doing. Lord, we lift our eyes from what we think we can possibly do. We lift our eyes to see what You're doing. And we declare that we will only do the things that we see You do. Because just as Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. We too can do nothing of ourselves. But in You, we can do all things. We ask that our expectancy would rise that we would know that we can do all things in You. Little old us, just lost, lost to Your will, lost to Your plan. What I mean by that is laying aside our agenda, laying aside our plan and understand that You have got a path that's set before us and that we would run that race with endurance, as Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We thank You, Jesus, that in 2022 and at every day, You will be our focus. You alone will be our focus. And we understand that we will function perfectly in our relationships and everything else when You are our focus. Everything will become healthy in our relationships that we have when you are at the centre of them. Everything will become well in our finances when you are at the centre of that as well. Everything will become well with our mind when you are the centre of our mind. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Spirit. We thank You for who You are. We thank You for whose we are. We thank You that inside of us, expectancy is rising. Expectancy is rising. That this is the acceptable year of the Lord. We would ask that You would have Your way in our lives every single day. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen.